Yen, please uh, welcome, um, please uh, join us on stage and uh, give Yen a warm welcome. He'll be talking about sound AI. Thank you very much, Anas. Actually, I will be talking a little bit about sleep a little bit later, so that was a, that was a good, good point to make. I'll be happy to help if I can. <laughs> so I, I uh, call my uh, talk here sound AI. So sound has this double meaning of, of course, sound, but also sound in the way healthy and how artificial intelligence can help in, uh, in that setting. So I'm with DTU Compute, another department here at, at uh, DCU, at the section called Cognitive Systems, where we are about 50 people dealing with all sorts of machine learning and cognitive uh, science. I'm also very happy to be directing the, the Danish Sound uh, Network, which tries to reach out to the, the greater community. My dream related to, to sound is to provide better quality of life by providing augmented and immersion sound experiences. So augmentation in this sense means, of course, it's about providing better, better sound, but it could also be much uh, a lot of other things which I will uh, come back to. And of course, it is in the context of society 4.0, and it's in the context of using AI. I'll try to flesh out what I mean by all these uh, wonderful uh, hyped uh, terms here in the, in the next uh, t 20 minutes. What is civilization 4.0 about? A lot of people talking about inter-civilization 4.0, which is driven, of course, by the internet, by the IoT devices, by the uh, possibility to do cloud and uh, fog and what have you, uh, computing. But um, it's also about that it actually will change our civilization. It will change dramatically, I think, the way that we are going to behave and uh, interact and understand the world in the, the future. So it's not about only in the industry 4.0, it's about the whole civilization. That's why I think it is so uh, really important that, that we make use of all the technology that we have in, in, in the right way. So of course, um, artificial intelligence in that sense is an important component. Um, I will come back to what, what it, it means in, in more of the, uh, concrete terms. Was, uh, if you go back to the 70s, for instance, it was uh, considered as, as formal uh, logic, and then it, it got a kind of a bad name for, for many years. People didn't like it because it didn't really work out the way it's supposed to do. But now we are, uh, I think, almost there again. But of course, it's not about the artificial intelligence itself. It's just a tool which makes us possible to do something that we really want to do, namely augment our intelligence. And augment our intelligence in this context is not just better hearing. It's also better, better understanding of the world mediated, mediated by, by, by the sound, right? And I think we all can agree in, in this room here that sound is one of the, the, the primary senses, probably the most important uh, sense at all. I do a lot of things in, in, uh, related to, to sound, some of it in, in healthcare and some of it related to other things as well. And just this thing about sound, how effective, how effective it is. It's not only about communication, it's also how it affects us as human being. So I just want to play a little nice YouTube video for you. Hi girls! It's August 6th. Is that right? Yeah. August 6th, 2012. Daddy's going to play them a little song while you're you eating their peas. Ready? You guys ready? we can model that, or, or can we? There's been a lot of research already trying to understand some of the basic mechanisms in, in, involved in that. And we're trying to see if we can, we can model that using computers and mathematical models. Uh, so for instance, uh, here, maybe it was about rhythmic 
entrainment that they moved uh, to the rhythm. They probably didn't know about the uh, the song before, uh, but um, in other contexts, it, it's really really important. I think we all all know a particular song that we have experienced in a particular situation, and once we hear that song again, we will recall that particular uh, situation. And it's not only about music, it's basically all uh, parts of sound. Come back to how we can probably use that uh, uh, later on. AI is also very effective. So there's been an AI revolution. I mean, it's not only one revolution, actually. I think we are on the third or fourth movement of, uh, of that. And the most recent version of, of that is, for instance, using mach machine learning. And machine learning is nothing but trying to learn from data, structures and pattern from historical data in order to predict and predict relations to, to things that we want to know about, some outcome metrics, for instance, how, how, we're, how well we're hearing or how much we are affected by, by sound and music. The difference between programming and ML uh, machine learning is basically that M, uh, machine learning infers new relations and patterns which are not programmed directly. Of course, it's a, there's still a recipe. The recipe is uh, typically stationary, but it, it can learn it and predict on, on new data. The most popular tool in that uh, toolbox at the moment is deep learning. And what is the difference between deep learning and the way that we did it uh, previously? So in, in, the, in the old days, it was much more physically uh, inspired, right? So in order to model a relationship between some audio input and some uh, output, we maybe hand designed programs, or we maybe hand designed features and try to map those features into the desired output. In the deep learning context, we just try to, in a sense, throw everything away and just learn everything from, from data. And I will give you a, a few examples uh, in a few slides here, which tries to model what we call end to end, end to end modeling just from data. And at first, it sounds ridiculous. Why, why should you throw away all the information, just learn anything, everything from data? And of course, this is maybe not completely true. But thinking in this framework actually provides a lot of new possibilities. So for instance, just to mention a few highlights of that recent research there, is for instance, speech recognition which is also an important part of uh, the chatbots and the ability to communicate with, with uh, devices. For a very, very long time, actually in the, the middle of the 70s, uh, the, the research community set out an agenda about different things that they want to achieve in, in speech recognition. And they were not achieved until 2010 when deep learning came into uh, to the game. And since then, it has went really, really fast and now we are almost down to human parity. That means that the systems are as good as human can do it, even in a noisy, in a, even in a noisy context. And that, that thing, that's, that's marvelous, uh, this curve here, uh, especially the last few, uh, few years. Another example is that machine learning is very effective for audio classification. So people now, especially uh, Google and Google DeepMind, have collected massive amounts of uh, uh, data sets, in this case, 2.1 million annotated videos and 5.8 thousand hours of audio and so on, and many, many, many uh, classes, uh, several thousands of, of classes, and shown that also deep neural network architects in this uh, context are able actually to solve the problem. Also wonderful. Another example is Machine learning is very successful for generating speech. So that's the other way around, coming from text to synthesizing, to synthesizing speech. Big problem. People have been investigating that for many, many years. It's a new architecture here, again, based on, on deep neural networks, which claims to do better than, than the traditional text-to-speech synthesizers, both in English and in Chinese, where it's tested in this case. Oops. So this looks a little bit strange, not coming through correctly. But uh, one of the, the, the drawbacks with machine learning, as also Torsten pointed out, is that some people consider it as a black box. 
It is a black box. It's basically mapping from one domain to another domain. So what is going on in there? Of course, we know what's going on in the processing. There's no secret in the processing. The only thing is that it, it's hard maybe to, um, to explain exactly what's going on. But of course, in a way, if you want to solve a complex problem, maybe you cannot expect a very, very simple solution or a very, very simple explanation. If you have a very simple problem, maybe you can expect a simple uh, explanation. Having said that, there's a lot of research also going on at the moment, trying to open up the box and trying to explain what is actually going on at, at uh, different levels. And one of the most important things in that respect is robustness. And it has been a fact that, uh, that, that deep neural networks tend to be a little unrobust in some uh, circumstances, that they're very sensitive to small perturbations on the input, which can cause large changes in, in the output. I've done some experiments uh, myself with, uh, with audio, where we just flip the input a little bit, then it will classify all over the, all over the place. So this is called ad adversarial uh, learning, which is a, a big a research field uh, at the moment. How do, we, how do we move on? And this comes to maybe discussing a little bit what is simple and what is more complex problems. And I have a passive to active uh, and autonomous axis out here. So if you're very passive, it's about exploring, it's about summarization summarizing the world that you experience. Once you have done that, you might go to the next step of trying to predict. That's what classical machine learning is trying to do, predict, predict the future. But if, if uh, the situation is really complex, you need to move on from that. It's not just about collecting data and uh, prediction like in standard machine learning. You need more things. You need to be able to continuously learn because the world is changing. You need to be proactive, you need to reflect, understand what's going on. And in order to do that, I think experimentation is a very, very important thing, that you can actually actively generate new data, but based on the knowledge that you already have. That's what we call interactive uh, learning, and that might be one of the new things which uh, might bring it uh, forward. Go on the other side here, I mean, in the 60s, you know, People talked about the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics. You have physics, right? You want to model the physics world. What could you do? Try to build a mathematical model, because then you understand the physics, and then you could explain and predict what's going on. Later on, in 2009, Peter Norvig, the head of, of uh, Google, talked about the effectiveness of data. Maybe throw away the math. Just have enough data. Then you basically just search and find the, the data point, which is closest to your application and just uh, um, um, repeat the, the answer in that context. Later on, Kapathy talked about recurrent neural networks, which maybe could solve that. I think that's still not enough. So experimentation, interaction, users in the loop, I think is going to be uh, very important in the, in, the, in the future. Then I will give you a few examples about interactive machine learning related to sound uh, applications. The first one is related to modeling uh, emotions in, in music. So that's an effective state. That's basically trying to model how music and, and sound uh, affect us. It's a hard problem. Uh, not so much because uh, we, we have the music and we can extract uh, audio features like we usually do. We can build a machine learning model, but the, the problem comes here. How do we actually try to model how users are affected and how they perceive the music, how they are affected by the music. That's the difficult part. And that's where a lot of psychology and a lot of what we call elicitation methods are in, involved in order to get that information uh, both correct, um, as, as correct as possible, but also respect the individual uh, variation. We've been working on that for, for several years and came up with some, some models which can, can do that to, uh, to, 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 some, uh, to some extent, at least. Important part of that is actually that we used active learning. Um, and that means that we are, we are basically building the, the model uh, iteratively. So uh, from a few, instead of uh, starting data, 
we try to collect new data based on how the, the model is already doing. And this enabled us to significantly reduce uh, the, the, the quest for, uh, for data in this context. And that's really important, especially for the way that we are doing it here, because we are comparing um, emotions uh, expressed in, in, different, uh, in different sound clips, which grows like a credit with the number of, of, uh, of, of clips. So we need an effective method in order to be able to, to do so. And this thing about interactive learning and sequential experimental design is a really, really an important, um, uh, important mechanism. So it can be used to optimize sound systems. It can be used to actually build uh, better sound systems in an uh, interactive way. It can even predict sound systems that we not even think, uh, thought about building yet. So it can predict the parameters of an optimal sound system before you even build it, and then, of course, you can build it, and then you can test it and see if how it matches with the, the model. So there's a lot of possibilities within uh, this framework. Another example is uh, hearing aids. And what I'm going to present today is uh, basically based on the work by uh, Jens Brehm, who's uh, sitting down there, former PhD student, now employed by, uh, by VDEX. So, um, we thought about uh, some years back, I think it was back in two, 2011 or something like this, about more directly involving users in fitting their hearing aids and using machine learning and as lean uh, interaction as, as possible. So in that um, project, we came up with an interactive scheme where listeners just are listening to different uh, sound clips and from their scoring or liking of the different sound clips, then we feed that information back to the machine learning algorithm in order to, to come up with a better setting of, of the hearing aid. Here's an example of, of that. So you can think of these two dimensions as two hyperparameters in, uh, or metaparameters in the in hearing aid. And you can see here is basically the scoring function. That means how good is the hearing aid working at the moment. And higher means, uh, means better. Of course, when we start this process, there was basically no knowledge about a good um, setting of, of the hearing aid. But as we moved on in something like 25 to 30 iterations, we were able to find a, a good situation just by listening to different sound clips. The other plot here is uh, telling about how certain the system is on, on the knowledge about where the good settings are. And this last picture here uh, is expected improvement. It basically, basically tells you where to, to sample for, for good solutions in the next step. So I just have a little clip here where you can see how it evolves from the very beginning. Now you see it's very green, meaning that means that we know nothing. And as time goes on in 25 steps, you will see that it actually is able to come up with a pretty good solution of the setting of, of the hearing aid. Still not much, but certainly it takes on uh, in a few steps. It's still exploring a little bit now. It's going to work, and now it oh, jumped a little bit up, and now it's found that a good solution seems to be down in the promise setting down here. Of course, this is something that we will move on uh, researching also in a new PT project in, uh, in collaboration with Ultricon. The last thing I'll talk about is um, this thing about using music more uh, actively, music and sound interventions. Uh, interventions. And we are uh, in a project right now uh, trying to improve sleep. That's where, come back to Anas' uh, uh, point here, trying to improve the sleep patterns for dementia patients. And you all know that dementia is a, is a huge uh, uh, disease, costs a lot of money, and has a lot of traumatic uh, consequences. So uh, what if, if you could use uh, music, for instance, or other sounds while people are trying to get, uh, to get some sleep and, and then hopefully improve their sleep patterns? The, the question now is, how do we design the music which helps them sleep better? I talked about before, there's a lot of basic mechanisms which basically could use, but what is the right sound or music for a particular individual? It depends on a lot of different factors. So it will be uh, pretty hard. So, so we, we, of course, thought about, again, censoring up uh, people so we can 
measure different uh, physical parameters, uh, but also, of course, we need to know a lot about uh, their situation by other means. So a recent uh, study here that we did um, tells that, that people who are really know about music and get influenced a lot by music, um, and I, um, when, we, when we stress them, we put them in a, a stressor condition, and then we try to see how they relax. And it seems like if they listen to unfamiliar but preferred music, they tend to uh, relax better. And that's some of the mechanisms that we would try to investigate in this bigger project where we tend to involve something like 90 uh, dementia people uh, in getting a better sleep. And um, we do this by all these kind of things. We intervene with sound. We need to, of course, monitor other treatments and interventions that they have. We measure physical and physiological conditions. We uh, also need some self-report. And of course, the environment itself could be, play an important role. For instance, if they get stressed out by a very noisy uh, television set in their living room or something like this, it might also influence the situation. That's what we try to model. Last, I will talk a little bit about the, the future as I envisioned it. So um, this is an old slide that some of you probably have, have seen before, but I think, and it also uh, links very nicely to what especially Uwe was talking about, what I call cognitive audio systems. So it, it's about really trying to do a complete modeling of the situation. So we need information about the context, who, where, and what. So it's not only about listening into the sound stream, it's about listening into all the different uh, streams and, and uh, context that a particular person is in. It's also uh, realizing that it is a mixed modality experience. It's not only sound alone, so the visual part, if there's any vision, and typically there is, is also important plus all the other sensors involved. So we cannot just uh, single out sound as, a, as, as an individual source. It comes in a package together with all the other sensors. And finally, the users in, uh, in the loop, both by direct and indirect uh, measures. So direct will be like putting EEG to devices like Torsten talked about on, on people's head or physiological measurements or indirect will be like asking them uh, questions in an intelligent way. So the, the four things I think that we, we need seen from a machine learning AI perspective is need the, the need for possibility to include co-creation and production. So we need the end users involved. And the end users could be the, the patients. It could also be the engineers who actually designed the, the sound systems. We need more data across domains and situations. I don't think that we have enough uh, data. So we need new platforms to collect much more data. Talked about big data sets already out there, but they are still pretty limited. Everybody is talking about big data. But actually, in a particular context, typically you have very, very small data still. So, so there's a lot of hype about deep data, but in, in, in reality, we're talking about very, very small data in, in most situations. Need for systems and platforms that enable experimentation and direct user inter interaction. That's where I'm very happy about the Evotion uh, platform, for instance, is one uh, example of that, where you're able to actually uh, do experimentations with, with the hearing aid and, and the users. And then, of course, need for better AI and machine learning methodology that can provide especially robust performance is one thing. Robustness is really, really important. It also needs to be interpretable. It needs to be interactive. And then, hence, being able to, to learn from a few examples, which I think is the realistic case. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Jen. Larsen, thank you very much. Thank you to uh, all our three presenters. And uh, we're in the strange and quite unusual situation that we are actually running ahead of schedule, which I don't think has ever happened before in my uh, career as a moderator, but it's fine because it gives us even more time for the panel debate as well as hopefully questions from you guys uh, at the end.